You've probably heard about GraphQL. If you're wondering what it is, why it benefits developers, and how powerful it is, you'll want to check out this on.NET episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of On.NET. My name is Jeremy Lickness, and today we have a special series that we're going to dive into exploring GraphQL. I'm here with Brandon Minnick. Brandon, welcome. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about what you do with Microsoft. Thanks. I work at Microsoft as a developer advocate. Uh, my background is actually in mobile with Xamarin. That's actually how I came to Microsoft via the Xamarin acquisition. But I've recently learned about this new cool technology called GraphQL that is literally made for us mobile app developers that I wanted to uh, share with the .NET community today. Okay, well let's dive into it. Tell us about GraphQL. Sounds good. So we'll start out with uh, an introduction. And so what, what is GraphQL? Where did it come from? It was actually invented by Facebook back in 2012. Uh, back in 2012, Facebook released their first app to the iOS and Android app stores. And when they did that, they found that the app was making a lot of API requests. And if you remember, back then, the Facebook app had some pretty bad reviews for being, <laughs> for being slow, for using a lot of battery life, for using a lot of your CPU. And that's because it was loading all of this data when the app launched. So if we look at this example here, this is an example from my Facebook feed, and we can see that every time the Facebook app launches, it pulls down information about my friends, recent stories and videos they've posted, and along with that, it's their, their avatar, their image, uh, the date and time, um, any status updates they've posted, and then the notifications tab next to it also loads when the app launches, and that has to get even more data about what my friends have been up to, recent events, friend requests, and so, you can see that this is just tons and tons of data. And if we think about this in the world of REST APIs, well, the Facebook app would be calling all of these different REST APIs. And what they found at Facebook was the app was making dozens, if not hundreds, of REST API requests every time the app launched. Because not only do you have to call the API to get the user ID, so you'll get the information about me as a user, you'll then make another request to get information about friend suggestions. But that might only return the IDs for the friends, and then it has so to make you're a, going for each friend. Has to make another round that. trip, and yeah, you had this cascading effect where you had to make all these round trips, and that's why the app took so long to load and ended up using so much of your battery life because we're just cranking through CPU cycles and our cellular data. So the smart folks at Facebook said, "There's got to be a better way," and what they did, they came up with GraphQL that condenses all of those APIs into one. Okay. And so, right, as, a, as somebody who's used REST before, you're probably thinking now, like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, how, how do we do that? Do we overload a query string with 15 different variables, or what is the approach to being able to collapse that into a single call? Good question. So, so with that one API endpoint, you can retrieve any data from the server. And the way that works is we have a GraphQL query language where we tell the API exactly what we want, and that is what the API returns back. So okay. this solves the, both problems. So it solves a problem of what was called overfetching, where maybe an API returns a bunch of data, but we only need two or three fields. Right. We throw away the rest away. So this will only give us the data we ask for. And if we look at this query here, we're actually nesting objects. So for example, I'm looking for information about a specific user. So I pass in the user ID. I say, tell me that user's name, the upcoming events count. Tell me that user's friend suggestions, but just the first one. And for that friend, give me that person's name and mutual friends count. And the response that comes back, this is a JSON response. So it's the same JSON we know and love from our REST APIs. But with GraphQL, it's exactly the data that we asked for. So we can see for the user, the name, my name is Brandon Minnick. I have four upcoming events. I have one friend suggestion here, just like I asked for, and it looks like it's for Seth Juarez. And All right. we have 18 mutual friends. And so even though we're nesting objects, that would be multiple round trips with a typical REST API. With GraphQL, we can do it all in one 
trip to the back end. So it sounds like you've taken what would be a bunch of different individually orchestrated requests. You've put, instead of the onus on the client to say, I want this, and then I want this, and then I want this, and I'm going to combine it. You're just taking that and pushing it over to the server and saying, you deal with this, but give me back exactly what I want. And the server probably has a better job of doing that because it's closer to where the data is. Yeah, and, and one of the things I love as a mobile app developer is that it gives me all the power. Uh, if you think about with REST, if I wanted to get different data or maybe I wanted to change the shape of the data that came back, I would have to create a new API endpoint. Right. But in reality, that means I have to submit a ticket to my backend team, they create the API endpoint, and then in a couple weeks when they get to it on the next sprint, then I can add that to my mobile app. But what I love about GraphQL is it gives me the powers on the client side to request any data I want. And as long as we've exposed that on the GraphQL endpoint, I can return it and use it in my app. So there is a piece of this, and I know in a future series we'll get into the back end side, but there is going to be some sort of configuration on the server to be able to support these GraphQL requests. Before we jump into that, though, I just recently did a series on a technology that's been around for a while called OData, yes. which sounds like it does <laughs> similar things in maybe a different way. Can you talk a little bit about how GraphQL compares or contrasts with OData? Yeah. Well, let's first take a look at this query here on the left, because okay. it looks like JSON at first glance, but if you squint in your eyes and look really close, it actually isn't. You'll notice it's missing the quotation marks, it uh, doesn't have the colons. And so this is a, this is the graph query language. But to answer your question, the biggest difference between GraphQL and OData is OData is a filter. So with OData, we have our, our REST API, it'll return back data, and we can filter what comes back. Okay. So with OData, it will, let's say we're requesting data from users. So um, we'll hit the API endpoint. The API will still do everything. Maybe it has to hit two or three databases, aggregate all that information together. And then before the data comes back is when OData filters it. So the API is still going to do all that work. We're just minimizing what comes back. So we're fixing the overfetching problem, okay. which is great. But one of the cool things with GraphQL, it's smart enough to know Jeremy only wants these specific fields, and all of those exist in one database. So I don't need to make multiple database requests. I'm just going to make the one database request and pull out that data. So it can Got also it. optimize your backend logic, too. OK, sounds good. So I tell you what, let's, let's actually jump into the GitHub GraphQL API and learn how to explore it for the first time. OK. So what I've done here, I've just navigated to GitHub's GraphQL API in my browser. And we, we are live, so I'm signed in with my username. And the first thing I want to show you is this documentation explorer here. So this docs explorer comes with this graphical user interface, this GUI called Graphical. And GraphQ, or Graphical, <laughs> Graphical yeah. is a free open source library that comes with your GraphQL API. So okay. in the next series where we show how to create our first uh, GraphQL backend, we'll see Graphical in there as well. And I didn't have to write any code for it. It, it just got it for free. Just part of that. Okay. That's right. So with Graphical, we get this documentation explorer. And on the left, we can actually start to create queries. So the way this documentation explorer works is in GraphQL, we have to define all of the types and all the different fields that the API will return. Right. So Graphical is smart enough to crawl through our API and present all that data here. So kind of similar to a Swagger, but we literally had to write zero code. So it's like an IntelliSense for an API, basically. That's a great way of, of thinking of it, because there actually is even IntelliSense over here right. in, the, uh, in the Query Explorer. So what we see here, we have two root types. And they are query and mutation. And these are the root types for every GraphQL endpoint. And so a query is your, if we're thinking about CRUD, query would be your reads. We're not changing anything on the server. We're just re returning data. Okay. A mutation 
is the opposite. So that's your updates, Side your effects. creates, your deletes, right. So what we'll do here, we'll, we'll create our first query because this is live data, so I don't want to change anything on my GitHub account. And the way this syntax works, on the left-hand side, this is literally going to be what we paste into our GraphQL query that we're forming. And then we can click on this query object to see all the different types of fields we can query for. Okay. So, you know, we're in GitHub and we see things that we'd expect, like you can search for licenses or the GitHub marketplace. There's things like the, we can search for a specific repository. But let's scroll down because there's one for user. So for user, it tells me I can query for a user, but I have to pass in a specific string, which is the user's login. So for me, my GitHub username is brminic. And then we're still not done yet because like we talked about earlier with GraphQL, we can only get back the data we ask for. So you ask for a user, but what about that user right. do you what, want? What about the user? And so you can see it's actually yelling at me. We got a red squiggle here in, in the browser. And then if I try to run it, I'll get errors. So yeah, let's check out what is available in this user object. And so you know, I see things here like we can return my user bio, um, my company name. There's things like the created at timestamp. And so now that we've specified the data we want, we get back exactly that. Nice. And so we can add more to this. Like there is, there's followers there. So I could say, show me how many people are following my, my GitHub account. And if we add it in, that data comes back. And if we take it away, it goes away. So this is cool, but you know, we're just in a browser here. Like how do we take this query and do it from, say, a real client-side API call. Sure. And so I want to show that real quick here in Postman. So Postman is just my favorite tool for making API calls. And we're doing it here on my computer where I've gone ahead and entered in the GitHub GraphQL API endpoint. And what I've done, I've set this to be a post request. OK. Now, this is kind of weird because we're talking GraphQL, not REST. But it turns out that every GraphQL request is a post request. Okay. So if you know how to make a post request using HTTP client in C Sharp, it's the same way you make a GraphQL request. So what we do now, we have a post, and in the body, in our JSON body, there's just one parameter or one field called query. And then the string we pass in is this query that we just figured out. So I'll go ahead and copy and paste this in. We'll get rid of some of this white space. So it's a JSON-like schema. The schema is not JSON. It's GraphQL query language. But you're passing it as a property on a JSON document and opposed to a REST API. That's right. OK. So suddenly, it all starts to feel familiar. <laughs> you can start thinking about how you call post async. And let's see, if we click send, it yells at me because we need to tell it to keep these quotes around my name. So if we click send again, there we go. There we go. And so there's exactly the information we asked for. And again, if we if we didn't care about what data I created in my GitHub account, we get rid of that, and we've reshaped the data all from the client side. Nice. So what I'm seeing from this is two things that excite me about it. One is the ability to have that full control from the client. But the second is that discovery process, the fact yes. that it exposes what's available. That seems like as a client developer is a tool that makes it so much easier Love when you're it. writing a new feature, how do I get to that feature? Well, I can explore and drill in and figure that out. That's right, because your documentation is never out of date. The live API will show you in the Documentation Explorer exactly what's available. Nice. So I know I threw a lot at you, so just a, just a quick review. So Git, or GraphQL APIs just have the one endpoint. Right. So there's one en API endpoint. It can return any data that you ask for. GraphQL APIs are self-documenting, so with Graphical, it'll explore our schema and expose that in the docs. GraphQL requests are just post requests, so if you know how to make a post request in C Sharp using an HTTP client, it's the same thing. We're just leveraging REST's post HTTP method. And the GraphQL request body is just JSON, so like you said, it's just one field, query, and then we can paste in that GraphQL query that 
we figured out using, uh, using the browser. And the GraphQL response is just JSON. So when we get the response back, it's the same JSON we know and love. We deserialize it into our C Sharp model and do whatever we need to do it do with it in our app. Or if we're not C Sharp, we can load it directly into our spa client, Angular, React, Vue, whatever that is. Absolutely. And just process it. Sounds good. Yeah, and so all of these resources, I've put together this website for us today that you can go find more information. If you want to learn more about GraphQL, you can head to this website. We've got links to teach you more. We've got links to sample apps that we'll be showing off in just a minute in our next episodes where we create our first GraphQL backend or where we connect our mobile app to it, all in C Sharp, and it's all available for you here online. Sounds great. Well, that was an introduction to GraphQL. As he mentioned, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into how do we set up the GraphQL backend and then how do we consume it from the client. So stay tuned, keep a lookout for that. That's been your On.NET episode. Hi, I'm Jeremy Lickness. You've watched another episode of On.NET. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss a show. And if you're interested in more shows, check out the link right here. Thanks.